A lion walks up, right? Nobody's standing around asking, do you want this spot, bruh? What's up, everybody? Hey, Ken Ma, welcome back to the channel. Hey, earlier this year, I was at the International Sportsman Exposition Show here in Sacramento. I was at speaking at the Western Bass uh, Demo Tank, and what a great crowd there was there. Um, and I dive into everything, like how do I approach the water, uh, what baits do I initially throw, what tackle I use. There were a lot of great questions. Give it a listen. Give me some feedback in the comments. Thanks for being here. Um, for me, although I have fished all over California, I primarily grew up fishing the California Delta. Okay, And a lot of times, I don't spend all my time talking about the California Delta, but, the, but today I'm going to, right? So if you want to talk stripers or things, um, fortunately, just like with Alex, I have, I have had a lot of high finishes and won a lot of tournaments in other bodies of water, okay? But the Delta is where I cut my teeth. I, I remember fishing the Delta with my dad with bait when I was five, six, seven years old, right? Um, it's a very mysterious place because of the tides and the grass. Uh, how I learned how to fish that place is with a crankbait. Okay, it's a lipped crankbait. It's a shallow diving, square bill crankbait. When I learned, I learned on a Bomber 7A. Anybody, any of you old timers know what a Bomber 7A is? A Bomber 7A, okay? I used to throw that 7A pretty much everywhere, okay? What I love about throwing a shallow crankbait, right? Randy's a lot different than I am, right? It's because Randy wants to fish deeper than I do. Well, at least with his crankbaits, okay? So when I throw this crankbait out, it floats, right? So it's a great bait to throw for a kid, like a kid to throw, because when you throw it out there, it's not sinking to the bottom and it's not getting all mucked up, right? So with a crankbait and almost any bait, what is very important, is you cannot do this, all right? If everybody can see that bait, oh, I got bit. I got bit right there. They are lucky I don't have hooks. I caught one two years ago and I got, uh, I got in trouble. So I'm not trying to catch one, although it's in our DNA to catch one. So when you're cranking this crankbait, right? And you're just cranking it along like this, right? And it's just moving along real lazy. Sometimes the fish want it like that, okay? But what's really important with everything you throw is you have to impart action on your baits, okay? There's times if you're fishing a lot of shallow grass, I'll oh, see, you did come back. All right, it's all right. Go ahead, sit down, it's cool. <laughs> so when you throw this, a lot of times, you know, you're cranking this, you're gonna snap your wrists like that. You see what the bait does? The bait is gonna dart and it's gonna hunt and those fish will react to that bait. So a lot of times when you're throwing a bait, it does not matter what it is. It could be a spinner bait, it could be a, a lipless, it could be whatever. You know, if you just snap and you keep your rod tip down and you put this action in there, that start and stop, that start and stop really will fire those fish up, okay? Um, I just got, I, before I got on the tank, I asked Alex Klein, right? I was at Shasta the last two days, okay? And those fish right now are glued to the bottom. Like you can't see them with your grass, right? I got $20,000 worth of grass on my, on my boat. I can't see a single fish, right? I'm like, where are they at? And he says, oh, they're all glued on the bottom, right? Because what happens is when a fish gets close to the bottom, within that three to five feet, our electronics, as advanced as they are, you, you lose sight of them when they get that close to the bottom, okay? So they're very lethargic. Whenever they're sucked up on the bottom, they're very lethargic. So what happens a lot of times is there's two things that I would go to. You could fish super slow, which is what he told me to do, right? It's, but that's not who I am, right? That's not how I get down, okay? So I like to fish fast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go there and I'm going to fish like I'll fish a jerk bait or I'll throw a crankbait. And, and what I do a lot of times when those fish are inactive, what's up Dan? When those fish are inactive, a lot of times you throw the bait out there and you just twitch it like that. And you crank it and you twitch it, right? And then you crank it, you twitch it. Obviously when you hit something, 
and you get that deflection, right? That's ultimately what you want. Oh, look. Oh, see, that'd have been two, right? But you see the difference? When I stopped that crankbait, perfect, right? I stopped that crankbait, and what did it do? It started floating up, kind of moving off to the side, right? That little dying or that, that, that kind of flutter is what those fish are used to seeing, right? Because crawdads, right, the crawdads are not always moving. Oh, I want to catch that one. Is he following me? So, you know, crawdads are always floating, they're hovering, they're not always moving, okay? So it's really important that when you take like a square bill like this, or any bait you throw, right? I'm gonna pull out a, uh, a vibrating jig here in a second. I'm gonna show you the difference, okay? Questions for free stuff? No? Nobody? No kid wants to ask me how old I am? Well, yeah, what's your question? Alice, go, go ahead. Let's... What'd she say? A giant trout? No, I don't catch trout. Go ahead, give her something. Give her something, Alex. There you go. Reels? Go ahead, Alex, hook them up. All right, so, so the, the question was real. So on a, on a square build crankbait, I like to use a lower gear ratio reel, especially when you're fishing it in five, six feet of water, right? You usually are not making a lot of uh, long presentations with it. So having a slower reel will actually slow me down when I'm digging through the grass and then when I'm trying to, to go in between things, okay? Yeah, right here. On lakes, how do you win without live scope now? How do you win with, okay. So his question is on lakes, how do you win without live scope now, right? So look, live scope is what everybody's talking about, but there's still people that are going out there, they're dragging jigs, they're fishing off of their map and their 2D sonar still, right? But they're not talking about it. Right, uh, Nick, the informative fisherman, he put a poll out on his uh, Facebook page. And, and if, if you saw that, I answered that the first thing that I would want in electronics is mapping. That's the number one thing, right? Because without mapping, if you're on a lake that you don't know, without mapping, how are you gonna get around? How are you gonna even find the rock pile, right? You can't live scope the whole lake Right? So, so live scope and forward facing is just, it's, it's part of the tools that we have. Currently, it's the most prevalent and prominent. So that's why you hear about it, okay? So I'll tell you, out of the, the, the last five wins I've had, I, didn't, uh, I, used, I only used uh, forward facing one time, right? So you have to know who you are though also, right? If you like to fish out suspended, water, suspended fish and things like that, then, then you're gonna go looking for that, okay? All right, so the second thing, yeah, go ahead. Alex, will you go get that for me? All right, so how do I know when I wanna use a square bill? Okay, so his question is, when I use a square bill, Rattle and no rattle, right? Because they make all kinds, okay? So typically, as the water gets dirtier or stained, I want some noise, but not always, because a lot of square bills, those big fat body square bills, like an ATV, right? With bright colors, they actually throw off a lot of vibration that, that even though it doesn't rattle, there's a lot of vibration in a really big bodied uh, square bill, okay? But general rule of thumb, water clarity, clarity will always dictate for me, rattle or no rattle. The darker the water gets, the more I want to rattle. The clearer and lighter the water gets, right? The more silent or stealthy I want to get. The other thing that impacts that is fishing pressure, right? You could have dark water, right? But if you have a lot of fishing pressure, you might get away from uh, using a rattle, okay? Like when I go to the US Open and fish mead, a lot of times I don't like using a rattle on Lake Mead, okay? So the, the second thing that I like to throw a lot, right, Brett Height put this bait on the map, is a vibrating jig, 
Okay? And basically, a vibrating jig, same thing, right? You got, the difference with the vibrating jig is when you, throw it, when you throw it in the water, it sinks to the bottom, right? When I threw my square bill up there, it floated on top, and you had to then drag it down to a specific uh, depth. With, with, a, uh, with a chatterbait or a vibrating, did I just get bit? <laughs> so a lot of times you can crank this, especially on the Delta, right? You can crank this around the grass, but the big thing again, okay, if you don't, if you don't leave with anything from listening to me speak, the biggest thing that you do is you want to impart action on this bait. You want to speed it up, slow it down. You want to kill it, right? You want to twitch it. You see how that bait is moving, dying, starting up, right? I, I've had, uh, like at, at Berryessa, when I won at Berryessa, which is not a place that I know that I should probably not have won at, uh, when I threw that bait out there at Berryessa, there was a lot of grass left in the lake. It was late October, early November. There was a lot of grass left on that lake. So when I throw this bait, I always tell people, you want this bait to get in the grass. If you're cranking this bait like this, right, you're throwing it out there and you're, you're doing what I call overworking this bait and you're just cranking it like this, you are going to catch, I would say you're going to catch 20% of the fish if you just slow down. And, and this is what I really mean. You want to hit stuff with this bait. Okay? If you're throwing a bait like this and you're not having a lot of success with it, slow down. Because when this bait hits something where it really shines, is it bounces off of that, right? It's that deflection, right? I got one hunting it or no? It's that deflection and that start up and stop that it wants again. Okay? So again, let it sink to the bottom. We want to make contact with things. If you're not making contact with things, just stop, right? Even though it has an open hook, it is surprisingly weedless, right? You know, and you're not gonna get caught up as much as you think. And I throw this everywhere, not just on the Delta. I've caught bags on Clear Lake, on Mead. Um, I've thrown it at Shasta, at Orville. Uh, you know, obviously on those lakes, I wanna throw a shad pattern, okay? But again, the biggest thing is all um, so, I actually have a two-time champion, Alex Klein here. Uh, he's incognito with a Vexus shirt on. I actually brought a lot of stuff from my sponsor. So if you ask questions and things like that, I like to reward that, uh, those questions. So if you have a kid or something, you ask a question, it could be about anything, okay? We'll try to get those questions answered. Come on and sit down, it's okay. No one's gonna bite you. There's plenty of seats right there. And then I have Zach Richards over here, who's also a Pro Tour uh, qualifier. So these guys are going to kind of walk around. They're going to have stuff ready to hand out. Uh, it is free, courtesy of GSM, Buckeye, uh, Big Bite, uh, those types of uh, companies, okay? All right. So um, for me, although I have fished all over California, I primarily grew up fishing the California Delta, okay? And a lot of times, I don't spend all my time talking about the California Delta, but, the, but today I'm going to. Right? So if you want to talk stripers or things, um, fortunately, just like with Alex, I have, I have had a lot of high finishes and won a lot of tournaments in other bodies of water. Okay? But the Delta is where I cut my teeth. I, I remember fishing the Delta with my dad with bait when I was five, six, seven years old. Right? Um, it's a very mysterious place because of the tides and the grass. Uh, how I learned how to fish that place is with a crankbait. Okay, it's a lipped crankbait. It's a shallow diving, square bill crankbait. When I learned, I learned on a Bomber 7A. Anybody, any of you old timers know what a Bomber 7A is? A Bomber 7A, okay? I used to throw that 7A pretty much everywhere, okay? What I love about throwing a shallow crankbait, right? Randy's a lot different than I am, right? It's because Randy wants to fish deeper than I do. Well, at least with his crankbaits, okay? So when I throw this crankbait out, it floats, right? So it's a great bait to throw for a kid, like a kid to throw, because when you throw it out there, it's not sinking to the bottom, and it's not getting all mucked up, right? So with a crankbait and almost any bait, what is very important 
is you cannot do this. All right, if everybody can see that bait, oh, I got bit. I got bit right there. They are lucky I don't have hooks. I caught one two years ago and I got, uh, I got in trouble. So I'm not trying to catch one, although it's in our DNA to catch one. So when you're cranking this crankbait, right, and you're just cranking it along like this, right, and it's just moving along real lazy, sometimes the fish want it like that. Okay, but what's really important with everything you throw is you have to impart action on your baits, okay? There's times if you're fishing a lot of shallow grass, I'll oh, see, you did come back. All right, it's all right, go ahead, sit down, it's cool. <laughs> so when you throw this, a lot of times, you know, you're cranking this, you're gonna snap your wrists like that. You see what the bait does? The bait is gonna dart and it's gonna hunt and those fish will react to that bait. So a lot of times when you're throwing a bait, it does not matter what it is. It could be a spinner bait, it could be a, a lipless, it could be whatever. You know, if you just snap and you keep your rod tip down and you put this action in there, that start and stop, that start and stop really will fire those fish up, okay? Um, I just got, I, before I got on the tank, I asked Alex Klein, right? I was at Shasta the last two days, okay? And those fish right now are glued to the bottom. Like you can't see them with your grass. Right? I got $20,000 worth of grass on my, on my boat. I can't see a single fish, right? I'm like, where are they at? And he says, oh, they're all glued on the bottom, right? Because what happens is when a fish gets close to the bottom, within that three to five feet, our electronics, as advanced as they are, you, you lose sight of them when they get that close to the bottom, okay? So they're very lethargic. Whenever they're sucked up on the bottom, they're very lethargic. So what happens a lot of times is there's two things that I would go to. You could fish super slow, which is what he told me to do, right? It's, but that's not who I am, right? That's not how I get down, okay? So I like to fish fast. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna fish, like I'll fish a jerk bait or I'll throw a crank bait. And, and what I do a lot of times when those fish are inactive, what's up Dan? When those fish are inactive, a lot of times you throw the bait out there and you just twitch it like that. And you crank it and you twitch it, right? And then you crank it, you twitch it. Obviously when you hit something and you get that deflection, right? That's ultimately what you want. Oh, look, oh, see, that'd have been two, right? But you see the difference? When I stopped that crankbait, perfect, right? I stopped that crankbait and what did it do? It started floating up, kind of moving off to the side, right? That little dying or that, that, that kind of flutter is what those fish are used to seeing, right? Because crawdads, right, the crawdads are not always moving. Oh, I want to catch that one. Is he following me? So, you know, crawdads are always floating, they're hovering, they're not always moving, okay? So it's really important that when you take like a square bill like this, or any bait you throw, right? I'm gonna pull out a, uh, a vibrating jig here in a second. I'm gonna show you the difference, okay? Questions for free stuff? No, nobody? No kid wants to ask me how old I am? Well, yeah, what's your question? Alice, go, go ahead. Let's... What'd she say? A giant trout? No, I don't catch trout. Go ahead, give her something. Give her something, Alex. There you go. Reels? Go ahead, Alex, hook them up. All right, so, so the, the question was real. So on a, on a square build crankbait, I like to use a lower gear ratio reel, especially when you're fishing it in five, six feet of water, right? You usually are not making a lot of uh, long presentations with it. So having a slower reel will actually slow me down when I'm digging through the grass and then when I'm trying to, to go in between things, okay? Yeah, right here. On lights, how do you win without live scope now? How do you win with, okay. So his question is on lakes, how do you win without live scope now, right? So look, live scope is what everybody's talking about, but there's still people that are going out there, they're dragging jigs, they're fishing off of their map and their 2D sonar still, right? But they're not talking about it, right? 
uh, Nick, the informative fisherman, he put a poll out on his uh, Facebook page. And, and if, if you saw that, I answered that the first thing that I would want in electronics is mapping. That's the number one thing, right? Because without mapping, if you're on a lake that you don't know, without mapping, how are you going to get around? How are you going to even find the rock pile, right? You can't live scope the whole lake, right? So, so live scope and forward facing is just, it's, it's part of the tools that we have. Currently, it's the most prevalent and prominent. So that's why you hear about it, okay? So I'll tell you, out of the, the, the last five wins I've had, I, didn't, uh, I, used, I only used uh, forward facing one time, right? So you have to know who you are though also, right? If you like to fish out suspended, water, suspended fish and things like that, then, then you're gonna go looking for that, okay? All right, so the second thing, yeah, go ahead. Alex, will you go get that for me? All right, so how do I know when I want to use the square bill? Okay, so his question is, when I use the square bill, rattle and no rattle, right? Because they make all kinds, okay? So typically, as the water gets dirtier or stained, I want some noise, but not always, because a lot of square bills, those big fat body square bills, like an ATV, right, with bright colors, they actually throw off a lot of vibration that, that even though it doesn't rattle, there's a lot of vibration in a really big bodied uh, square bill, okay? But general rule of thumb, water clarity, clarity will always dictate for me rattle or no rattle. The darker the water gets, the more I want to rattle. The clearer and lighter the water gets, right? The more silent or stealthy I want to get. The other thing that impacts that is fishing pressure. Right? You could have dark water, right? but if you have a lot of fishing pressure, you might get away from uh, using a rattle. Okay? Like when I go to the US Open and fish mead, a lot of times I don't like using a rattle on Lake Mead. Okay? So the, the second thing that I like to throw a lot, right? Brett Height put this bait on the map, is a vibrating jig. Okay? And basically a vibrating jig same thing, right? You got, the difference with the vibrating jig is when you throw it, when you throw it in the water, it sinks to the bottom, right? When I threw my square bill up there, it floated on top, and you had to then drag it down to a specific uh, depth. With with a uh, with a chatterbait or a vibrating, did I just get bit? <laughs> so a lot of times you can crank this, especially on the delta, right? You can crank this around the grass. But the big thing again, okay, if you, don't, if you don't leave with anything from listening to me speak, the biggest thing that you do is you want to impart action on this bait. You want to speed it up, slow it down. You want to kill it, right? You want to twitch it. You see how that bait is moving, dying, starting up, right? I, I've had, uh, like at, at Berryessa, when I want at Berryessa, which is not a place that I know that I should probably not have won at, uh, when I threw that bait out there at Berryessa, there was a lot of grass left in the lake. It was late October, early November. There was a lot of grass left on that lake. So when I throw this bait, I always tell people, you want this bait to get in the grass. If you're cranking this bait like this, right, you're throwing it out there and you're, you're doing what I call overworking this bait and you're just cranking it like this, you are going to catch, I would say you're going to catch 20% of the fish, if you just slow down, and, and this is what I really mean, you want to hit stuff with this bait, okay? If you're throwing a bait like this and you're not having a lot of success with it, slow down. Because when this bait hits something where it really shines, is it bounces off of that, right? It's that deflection, right? I got one hunting it or no? It's that deflection and that start up and stop that it wants again, okay? So again, let it sink to the bottom. We want to make contact with things. If you're not making contact with things, just stop, right? Even though it has an open hook, 
it is surprisingly weedless, right? You know, and you're not gonna get caught up as much as you think. And I throw this everywhere, not just on the Delta. I've caught bags on Clear Lake, on Mead. Um, I've thrown it at Shasta, at Orville. Uh, you know, obviously on those lakes, I wanna throw a shad pattern, okay? But again, the biggest thing is always impart that action, that startup, that stop, right? Like what I'm doing with my reel, right? Here, I'm just speeding it up a little bit and then I'm letting it die and I'm letting it flutter, right? Really important. And if you're teaching young kids, right? Teach them that, that hey, you wanna hit something, it's okay. Your lure getting hung up, that's where the bass live, okay? They don't, they don't live out in the open. Right? I always say the same thing. If I come to your house, you, if I come to your house, okay? If I go to your house, there's a chair in your living room that you sit in, right? Is that your son? Okay? If your son's sitting in your chair and you walk into the living room and you did things right, what does he do as soon as you walk into the living room? He gets up and he moves, right? Because you're the lion of your house, right? When a lion walks up, Right? Nobody's standing around asking, do you want this spot, bruh? Right? Do you want where I'm standing? No, you don't ask a lion, right? If they move to where you're at, you're like this. Right? You're out. And that's what these bass, these, the biggest bass are just like lions. They want to occupy the best spot on the spot. And a, and a seven pounder, a six or seven pounder, can dominate an area as big as this grandstand, and it can guard this entire area and own the best spot in this area. Until when? Until an eight or nine pounder shows up, right? That's how it works in nature, okay? Questions, yes? Okay, great question. So his question was, what are the differences in my retrieve? Like if I'm fishing currented water or if I'm going to a lake where there's not a current? It's actually a great question, okay? So on the Delta or anywhere that you fish with current, whether it's uh, man generated or, or a power plant generated or nature generated or wind generated, because on lakes that don't have current, if the wind blows, it will generate current, okay? My number one rule, is you always face into the wind when you're fishing. It is more work sometimes, right? But that's what you do. And in my opinion, what happens when that current is coming this direction, those fish want to face up current, right? Because it's easier for them to flap their tail and just stand here or sit here in the current, right? If they're this way, how do they stop themselves from being in the current if it's pushing them downstream? So they got to turn and face, okay? So 100% of the time, whenever there's any type of current, I'm always going to fish into that current or into the wind until Mother Nature says I can't, right? So if the wind's blowing 12 to 15, it's a lot of work in our boats, but I can hold my boat in 12 to 15. Once it gets 15, 20, 30 miles an hour. I mean, it's really hard to hold your boat in place and then it's even harder to cast a bait into the wind, right? So then at that point, I will change my, uh, the way I'm attacking uh, because mother nature is requiring me to do that, right? Did you take care of them? Great question. Okay. Yeah, right here. Alex? The trailer? Okay, so um, trailers are endless on this bait, okay? So what I'm gonna tell you is throw what you have confidence in. That's the most important thing, okay? Now, I throw, this is a big bite swim on, it's four and a quarter inches long. As you can see, the tail is very wiggly, right? It's got two little claws, it's got a little spaced out spacers. You know, it really uh, is erratic, okay? If you wanna go buy 50 bags of these, I'll be happy about it, okay? But but what I think is most important is that you throw what you have confidence in, okay? Like, okay, like Alan Fong. Everybody know Alan Fong? Okay, mentor of mine. Oh yeah, give him a hand, okay. I'm telling you, he throws firecracker red on the Delta. 
He tells me every spring, throw firecracker, throw firecracker, throw firecracker, right? I try throwing, I can't catch him on it. I can't catch him on it, right? He not lying to me, right? It's just when I'm throwing it, you know, the water on the delta is getting clearer and clearer every year. So when you're throwing firecracker, you know, yeah, I know he catches them on it. I've seen it. I've been in the boat when he catches them on it. But I throw it, I can't catch them on it, right? So my response is always throw what you have confidence in. Just because I throw something that works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you or you or somebody else, okay? Alex, we got another question right there. Thanks for coming. Oh, okay. Hook her up. Her question was, how deep do bass go? I think bass will go a couple hundred feet. The deepest I have personally caught a bass is 70 feet. 70 feet. I, that's deep for me. 70 feet is like, I, it's not that deep because I don't know how long this tank is. I, don't, I guess this tank's like 40 feet. So it's 30 more feet behind, but beyond that. But 70 feet's a long ways for me. My, my reels stop at around 10. But they just stop. They hold more line than that, but they, when I throw out deeper, it stops. Z, I got one right here. All right, so. Your house, me and Zach, with a rope, and tried to pull you out your front door, something's gonna happen, all right? We're probably not gonna win, all right? Right? I come to your house and hook a rope to your ankle and try to pull you out the front door, but one of us is getting hurt. <laughs> All right? That's what we're trying to do with this technique, right? You're basically putting this bait into their house where they live, and it is the jungle, okay? So it's really important, okay, that it's almost like playing linebacker, right? I tell people your feet, your knees, your hips, your shoulders, and what you're looking at, you have to be square to that target, okay? I, I had, two years ago, I had a conversation with this man right here, right? And he asked me specifically about this technique. He went out and did the work on his home body of water, and two years ago, he beat me on the Delta with something he learned two years ago, right here, okay? He, he won a pro-am, a major pro-am, on this rod, Two years prior, what he said to me is, I'm tired of getting beat and I have to learn how to do it. That's what he said to me, right? So I respect that he takes two years and he does the work, right? He listens to people that, are, that he sees that are better than him and he does the work. Yeah, I had another friend that asked me, well, hey man, aren't you mad that Alex beat you on, on the Delta? You came in second and you taught him. I didn't teach him. I gave him the ingredients, he did the work. I can tell you everything today, if you don't do the work, you're gonna be just as good as you were when you walked in, if you don't do the work, okay? So with this, just like I told him, feet, knees, hips, shoulders, square to this target. You cannot be right here fishing this bait, okay? This does not work, because when you get bit, you're gonna let that six, seven, eight pounder, okay? Here's my visual. Okay, I'm gonna let John grab my bait, okay, and walk around this grandstand one time, then I'm gonna set the hook. What are the chances that I'm gonna even put that hook in him? Slim to none, slim to none, okay? So that's very important that you are right here focused on this bait, okay? Alex, I got a question up there, okay? Okay, <laughs> you watch my videos? All right, great question. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about two hook sets, okay? His question was, do I slack line them? Okay, my re response emphatically is yes. That's, that's the majority of the fun for me, okay? But there's two kind of hook sets that people employ in this, okay? And the first one, okay, you flip in there, 90% of your bites will come on that initial fall right there, okay? That bait has hit the bottom now. The reason I know that bait has hit the bottom is because my line is laying on top of the water, 
Okay, so I watched my line as that bait fell, I watched my line go all the way to the bottom. Okay, because I just told you, 90% of the bites will come on that initial fall. And 90% of the big bites will come on that initial fall. Okay, as soon as it hits the bait, I'm gonna answer your question. As soon as it hits the water, the first thing you should do, if nothing stopped your bait, if it didn't speed up, slow down, if nothing stopped, you're gonna do just this, okay? Everything's about body language. I'm right here. What I'm gonna do is I put both my hands on our reel and I pick up just like this, that light, okay? What, what I am doing is I am checking the weight of my bait. Remember that term, okay? This is an ounce bait. I have thrown ounce and three quarter. I've thrown two ounces before, okay? So when I take this bait, and I flip it out there. I'm right there, falling, falling, bottom, okay? My line has went slack, nothing happened. What I'm gonna do, the reason I put my other hand on my rod is because you'll be amazed, not only am I ready to set the hook, but you'll be amazed at how much, um, obviously I like a Bill Lewis half ounce rattle trap on the Delta. The reason I like the Bill Lewis, the reason I like the, this Bill Lewis half ounce rattle trap on the Delta is because when you throw it out there, see how it falls? You guys see how it falls? It kind of like, it, it, it falls almost like a spoon, okay? A lot of the premium baits, right, what happens is like, like I throw a Lucky Craft, I throw a Jackal, right? I throw all this other stuff. And a lot of those premium baits, they fall straight to the bottom. And because on the Delta you're fishing a grass fishery, you want to bait a bait that flutters more than it sinks, right? So that bait, like see how I'm popping it and it flutters, right? So it does a much better job at fluttering, right, than the other baits do. The other baits, they wanna fall straight down to the bottom and what happens on a grass fishery, when it falls straight to the bottom, you see how erratic this, this bait is? I mean, I, I hardly have to do anything to make it erratic, right? I'm just pumping it just like that, right? And it's just, it's erratic, right? And the fish, they want that erraticness. And this bait does that for you, right? It's really an easy bait to throw around grass. Like you can burn it back and you see how erratic it is. You kill it and they eat it, right? Right? I mean, that bite has happened like at Clear Lake before. You take this bait, you reel it 10 feet, right? And you let it flutter and they eat it when, it when it's fluttering like that because they feel like it's running and then dying, right? That's the action, okay? What you, what you should never do with any bait, right? Is just take it and just reel it back. Well, I mean, sometimes I'll eat it that way, but it's just reel it back or burn it back, right? Because if you do that, again, you're not gonna catch the majority of the fish. Okay, great question about the Delta. All right, so his question is, is do I run or chase the tides? So on the Delta, okay, there's typically four tide cycles in a 24 hour period. Two highs, two lows, okay? Sometimes there's up to six feet of water moving, okay, on the high end. Meaning the high tide could be a 480, a five foot. The low tide could be a minus one, minus 1 1.5. Hence you have your six foot tide swing, okay? so. For me, I'm always gonna chase the bite window that I discover in my tide, okay? So I'll give you an example. If I want a high switch, let's say I found a bite that I, that I need a high switch for, okay? And out, out, at, out, at, out west, the water gets higher three hours sooner than it does in Stockton, okay? And then in Tracy, it gets higher about 40 minutes later than Stockton. Okay, everybody understands that concept? Okay, so if I have a high tide at seven o'clock in the morning out west, what time is it high tide in Stockton? Three hours later is 10, all right? Okay, so I can run west. I can fish that high outgoing tide from seven to eight o'clock, right, right? It was high at seven, it's turning and it's going out, right? I'm gonna get two hours of that high switch. At some point, based on what I discovered, 
at some point, those fish are going to stop biting. It could be at 8. It could be at 8.15. Literally. It could be at 8.09. Literally. And it'd be over, done. They're not biting again. Okay? So if I want to go to Stockton at 10, I can't leave the west at 8.15. It only takes me 30 minutes to get to Stockton, right? So if I get there, it's going to be 8.45. I'm going to be early. So what I do now is I need to find stuff that's going to occupy my time to make me productive during that window of less opportunity. All right? So for me, I'm always going to chase the tide based on the window I found. And if you fish enough, a window will always emerge. Okay? If you only fish one day a week, it's hard to discover, right, what that window is. But when you, if you can fish, if you really want to learn about the delta and you want to fish two, three days in a row, if possible, that's what's going to give you a window will emerge. You do the work, you put yourself in the right situation, you throw the right bait, you'll see that, oh, okay, hey, around 9 o'clock today, they bit from like 9 to, to 12, all right? And you come out the next day and you're like, oh, they bit from 10 to 1, right? And then you come out the next day, you're like, oh, they bit from 11 to 2, right? Here's the problem with chasing the tide. I just gave you a scenario where in three days, your tide went away from you one hour a day. That's what happens. Every day, 50 minutes, you lose that tide for 50 minutes, okay? So if you start on Wednesday and you find fish, you stay on those fish on Thursday, and you stay on them on Friday, on Saturday, where's your tide? It's 4 o'clock. And if you're fishing a tournament, you're done at 3. And if you have a 30-minute run, you're done at 2.30. Right? And the mistake people make is they still run to them. That's the problem with the Delta. Is you found fish somewhere, you think it's like Clear Lake, where you can go to a spot, you can sit on them, and generate the bites. On the Delta, like I said, and, and if anybody's ever heard Bobby Barrick speak, on the Delta... Sometimes you have a six, seven, eight minute window. Sometimes you have a bigger window. And I'm telling you, if you are there, there's places on the Delta that I, that, that I have fished where if you show up five minutes late, it's over. You will swear that there's not a fish there to be caught. That's how specific the tide is when you're on a tidal fishery like that. That water movement, that flow, it matters so much, okay? Anything else? All right, we're good? Okay, all right, so the, the other question is what's expected of co-anglers in a pro-am tournament if you decide to fish a pro-am pro -am tournament? This is for me. Number one thing, you come with an attitude that you wanna learn. You fish hard all day, right? You fish hard all day right? No matter what. Those two things you can control. That's your attitude, right? If you can't control those two things, there's not much else in fishing you can't control, okay? So have a great attitude, learn, right? Fish hard. Some of the other things that would, that would be a great benefit is you have your own rods and reels, obviously, and you can handle your own tackle. You can retie your line, you know, your, your baits, and you stay open to what we're trying to accomplish that day. Right? Other than that, have fun. How many rods you can bring? Um, I would say if you bring six to eight, a lot of times you'll have a conversation with your pro the night before, and your pro will talk to you and, and tell you what to bring. All right, so last thing. Again, I got a lot of stuff to give away. You guys aren't taking advantage. When I go talk to high school kids, they're just asking me random questions. How old are you? When's, what, you what did you eat yesterday? Right? Are you driving home after this? Right? They just want free stuff. So, um, with the trap, okay, a lot of times I throw this. This is almost an eight foot cranking rod made by Shimano. It's a Zodius. You see how much parabolic bend it has back here? Okay. I like that parabolic bend, especially when you're throwing treble hooks and lipless baits. Right? You need a lot of this for giving. What do I got? Okay. You need a lot of this forgiving tip, okay? Because what happens is when a fish eats you, 
you want that tip to give here a little bit, okay? And then you want a lot of backbone in here so you can drive those hooks through, especially a lot of times when you're making, when you're making really long casts with this bait, okay? So it's a basic uh, cranking setup. I like to use 16 pound uh, Sunline FC crank. I think it's a great line to crank with. On this reel, I use a XG, so it's an eight, four to one, okay? The reason I like to use a high speed reel is when you make a long cast, okay? So I make this long cast, right? Like, you know, three times the length of this, of this tank, right? My bait falls, okay? A lot of times when you're working this bait, if you're sweeping this rod, you see how high my rod is? Then the bait falls and you get bit right there. You see how much line I have out? I probably got 15, 20 feet of line out, okay? Don't use a slow speed reel because you have to work that much harder to catch up to that fish, right? So I use a high speed reel for this technique, okay? The reason is, again, when I sweep this rod and it's falling, I get bit right there. I need to pick up this line, right? So on an eight to one, like this Shimano, this Corrado, every reel, every reel rotation on this reel picks up about 42 inches of line, right? So that's, you know, it's a yard and change, right? Because it's, it's about that line pickup. So again, a lot of erratic, erraticness, right? We're pumping it a lot. Let it catch the grass. So I want to leave you with these things. What time is it? Okay, so I'm going to leave you with these few things. Remember, do not leave Randy Maccabee of Stealth Sticks is going to talk, well, he better talk, or else he's going to make me a liar. He's going to talk about deep cranking. He is one of the best at that technique. So if you want to know the tricks on how to do that, line, reel, rod, what to look for, that kind of stuff, um, you know, hang out. I think he's on at 3.30, okay? So again, I want to leave you with this. Always fish what you have confidence in, okay? Your buddy tells you they're catching them on that, right? Be open, okay? But do what you have confidence in because when the fishing gets tough, because it always gets tough, right? Fishing and easy rarely go in the same sentence, right? Never use fishing and easy in the same sentence, right? It's never easy, okay? So when fishing gets tough, okay? You are going to fish what you're throwing, what rod, what reel, whatever it is, what color, what bait. When the fishing gets tough, you're going to fish that bait way more intently than you are fishing something somebody told you or something you heard or something, okay? But also be open, all right? And never, ever, ever stop having fun. Okay, and then what types of lakes do you fish? Uh, I mean, I fish everywhere else in Clear Lake. I live near Folsom, but I don't think that's really Okay, so, so I'm the opposite. If I can get away with throwing a bladed jig first, I'm going to throw that over a swim jig first. I will throw that first. If they eat it, I keep throwing it. If they eat it and stop eating it, then I'll go to a swim jig. Do you see one as like a finesse version of the other? I, no, I think it's different. I think different. they're both different, yeah, yeah. Well, see, with a bladed jig, when you reel it, it wants to lift. With a swim jig, if you have the right setup, when you reel it, it tends to want to stay laterally or want to go toward the bottom more. So it's two totally complete different things, right? Because like I said, a, a bladed jig, when you reel it, to work a bladed jig easily, five feet. You, everybody agree? You throw that bait, a kid can just reel it and it, it'll work four to five feet easy. Where it gets hard is when you want to work that bait six feet and deeper, right? Then you got to focus. Then you got to slow down. Then you got to, right? Everything else has, everything changes. Where a swim jig, hey Greg, where a swim jig, it's easier to fish in that six to 10, 20, 30 foot water column. Okay, so I'll take a place like Clear Lake, for example. Sometimes you're just on a hellacious bladed jig bite, right? Pressure comes in, happens all the time. 
pressure comes in, right? He'll say throw a fairy wand. He always teases me about it, right? But pressure comes in, you go to a swim jig, and you can generate some more bites, right? That's Colors, how, that's how I look at it, size. right? That's Take that's typically how I how, how I'll look at it is if it can generate a few more bites in an area that I feel like the quality's there, then I'll go do that, right? But for me, I'm the opposite of you. I'm 80% bladed first, and then if I have to, I'm then 20% swim jig. See, where you like to throw a swim jig more, you know, so I would tell you to increase your bladed. I, I honestly think, you know, if I asked him and him, we've caught more bigger ones on a bladed jig than a non-bladed jig. I know I have for sure, right? So, well, like if you go to lakes where there's not a lot of grass, you have to fish it slower. Like, like when I go to Shasta, I'm fishing that bladed jig in eight to 12 feet of water. You know how hard it is to fish a bladed jig in eight to 12 feet of water? I mean, it is, it's freaking hard. <coughs> you, you throw it out there, you gotta let it sink to the bottom. You start reeling it and it starts lifting, right? So like, I'm, I'm like doing this with my reel. Just You're enough. Almost fishing it more like a Texas jig. Right, right. But just enough for the blade to turn and, and enough for me to fill the bottom. And then when I lose, uh, when I lose, when it lifts too high, I, I gotta disengage my reel and let line out. That's freaking a lot of work. Yeah, it's so much work, right? Where a swim jig, you know, you can throw out there, half ounce swim jig, you throw out there and you can just kind of reel it kind of slow and steady and it'll stay on the bottom the whole time, you know? But what I'll tell you is like places like Shasta and Oroville, even at Lake Mead, they're not used to seeing that bait, right? No one's throwing a chatter bait on Comanche. Right, no one's throwing it on Folsom, exactly. Nobody's doing that. Right? So you do that, right? And you get good at it. A lot of times too is I'll go to a uh, lighter uh, pound test on those clear water lakes. I might go to 16. You know, use, I'll start at 20. I've gone to 18. Um, as the lightest I've ever gone is 16. So, yeah, because that lighter diameter will help keep it down too. Yep. Can what are your favorite techniques on the low if I top have water. My that's the toughest tide it's the me. most fun tide to throw top water on <clears throat> from April 1st to about November 1st. Yeah, top water. I mean, I just, I love throwing a frog, a buzz bait, a chopo. You know, when the lower the water gets, the more I want to throw top water. <laughs> 